Naples, Florida, May 2014. The next encounter shows us that even though we think we know an area, there are creatures surrounding us that we never see. Creatures that hide and only show themselves on their schedule. It's safe to say that we need to always stay vigilant and to keep aware of our surroundings completely. The sun had been beating down mercilessly on John ever since he started his visit to the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in Naples, Florida. He had arrived a bit later than normal that day and quickly remembered why he liked visiting right when they opened. Because the mornings are cooler. He paused to take a drink from his water bottle and wipe the sweat from his brow, and he surveyed his surroundings. He never got tired of visiting the place, even though he had been coming at least once a month for the past few years. Sometimes he would even take a day off from his job as a utilities maintenance technician for the city of Naples, just to visit the swamp. His job required him to install, maintain, and repair pumps, motors, and electrical controls for various structures for city utilities. It was basically a lot of technical stuff that could be stressful. So visiting the sanctuary and being in nature periodically helped him to reset his head. This day, he was deep into the walk along the two-mile boardwalk, and he was now at the heart of it, in the bald cypress area where you had some of the best chances of catching glimpses of some animals that lived there. Many were elusive, and it was those that he challenged himself to find. In general, the sanctuary is home to many animals, including alligators, otters, eagles, and Florida panthers. But in the end, for most visitors, It's the massive cypress trees that are the main attraction. Some of the trees are over 500 years old, and they tower overhead, creating lots of shade, and their thick roots create an eerie underworld in which anything could hide. With each visit, John said he was able to see something new that he hadn't noticed before. He even made it a challenge to spot something new. Most importantly, though, he knew that if you timed it right, you could have the place to yourself. Although, admittedly, there could be a creepy feeling to the place when you were alone out there. It almost seemed otherworldly with its strange plants, animals, and ancient trees growing in the swampy undergrowth. The land and the surrounding area was nothing like anywhere else in the world, with some of the ancient trees being over six feet in diameter and over a hundred feet tall. John looked out into the swamp trying to notice an animal hiding in the dense foliage and the underbrush. It was thick and lush where he stood, and it took a unique species to be able to live there, he thought. He remembers that the day was getting so humid that he could feel the sweat dripping down his back, and even watched droplets of water roll off the leaves around him. He also remembers thinking that something seemed different in the air that day, but he chalked it up to being extra hot and humid, more so than any of his previous visits and he wished he had packed more water. But he didn't want to head back just yet, and so he pushed through the heat, and he continued to stand there and watch. Soon, a noise broke the silence. He heard a rumbling and rustling in the bushes off to the side, a noise that he hadn't heard before. His heart quickened as he got excited, thinking he would see an alligator, or perhaps a Florida panther, or maybe even an animal that he hadn't ever seen before. He slowly took a few steps along the boardwalk towards the noise, trying to make no noise. At the same time, he reached for his camera, which was slung around his neck, and he brought it up to his eye, and he looked through the lens. What he saw made his heart drop, a massive, wolf-like creature standing about 20 feet from him. It was halfway hidden between one of the massive trees, but still visible through the camera lens. It was a huge, wolf-like creature, its eyes boring into him from the shadows. The creature was easily twice the size of any normal animal that should be in the swamp, and knowing that this thing was out of place, John knew he was in trouble. He dropped his camera from his face and stared at the creature directly with his eyes, not knowing what to do as the animal continued to stare at him. His heart was still pounding in his chest, and he could feel the blood rushing through his veins and echoing in his ears. The creature made a jerking movement towards the boardwalk, 
and John leapt back from the rail so hard that he bumped into the railing on the opposite side. With a sudden movement from John, the creature stopped, but was still staring at him. John could see that it was definitely a wolf, or at least some hybrid type of creature with a large head and furry body, but it was unlike any wolf he had ever seen. And it was at least twice the size of a normal wolf, with its fur a mottled mix of gray and brown. It also had large, sharp teeth that were bared at him as it stared at him. The creature made another move towards John, this time more slowly, and stopped just a few feet from him, just on the outside of the railing furthest from him. Thank God for the boardwalk and its railing, which was now the only thing between John and the creature. John could see its eyes now, and they were an eerie yellow color. No wonder they glared at him from the shadows the way they did, he thought. The wolf creature then sniffed the air before turning its head to look out into the swamp. John could see that it was sensing something, smelling the air to catch the scent of probably another animal. Whatever it was, John was just happy that the attention had been taken off of him. And then after a few minutes, the creature seemed to lose interest in John, who had just stood there, leaning, unmoving against the railing. And then the creature started to move away, walking away on two legs and disappearing back into the dense, shadowy growth from which it had come. John remained in the same spot for a long time, not knowing what to do or if it was even safe to continue along the boardwalk and back to the visitor center. He still hadn't seen anyone else, and his heart was pounding in his chest. Now he even felt extra lightheaded and dizzy. He knew that if this creature was still nearby, watching him and deciding to attack, he would be dead in seconds. The strength and the power of it hadn't been lost on him. John's first instinct was to run, but he knew that he would just make it obvious that he was scared, and that could kick in the creature's prey instinct and make it more likely to attack. John's legs were shaking so badly he could barely stand, but he managed to get himself moving and to walk as normally as possible back to his car. It took 30 minutes to get back there since he was walking along at such a leisurely pace. But as soon as he got back to the Blair Audubon Center, which was the gateway between the swamp and the parking lot, he started to sprint, and then he ran the last few hundred feet to his car, not wanting to waste any time getting out of there. He got in his car, locked the doors, and just sat there for a few minutes, trying to calm himself down and wrap his head around what had just happened. He turned on the ignition, and he blasted the air conditioning, hoping that cooling himself down could help his head get back in order. He sat in the car for a few minutes, trying to calm his heart and thinking about what he had just seen. He knew he had to tell someone, but he wasn't sure who or how. After 20 minutes or so, he calmed down a bit, and with a clearer mind, he decided to go back to the main gate and tell the ranger there what he had seen, what had happened. Most of them recognized him from coming so often, so he told them, as calmly as possible, what had just happened. He showed them on a map where he had seen the creature. He told them they would definitely look into it. The ranger thanked him and told him that they would be in touch if they needed anything further. John went home that night, still shaken up from his encounter, but feeling better that he had reported it and that there would be a search party looking for the creature. In the end, the search party never found the creature, or at least, John never heard anything further from the rangers, and he never heard anybody else mention it again. But to this day, when he thinks about that day, and what he saw, he still can't quite shake the feeling that it's still out there, somewhere, waiting to be discovered, or waiting to discover him. Two of my friends and I were headed to Grafton Lake State Park in New York on a Sunday evening in the summer of 2005. We were on summer break from college and were going to camp that night nearby and head into the park and over to the lake in the morning. We were trying to get there in enough time to set up camp before it got too dark. I remember it was around 5 o'clock at night. We had the windows down and were enjoying the scenery as well as celebrating the end of the day since we had all worked that day at our respective summer jobs. All of a sudden, my friend sitting in the back seat yells behind me. What was that? 
I looked at him, and he had his head tilted out the window, staring out into the woods and pointing. I looked out my window in the direction he was pointing, and I saw this large, bipedal creature running through the woods, its image flashing in my mind as it ran and flickered behind the trees. It was hard to tell exactly how far away it was because the thing seemed huge. I would put it at about seven feet or more and about 50 yards or so away. One thing about it that really confused me was the way it ran. It was very odd. It seemed to be running on two legs, but its arms were swinging back and forth like the way a human would run, and its head was bobbing up and down as it ran, which made me think that maybe it was chasing something and trying to keep its eye on some kind of prey. I had never seen anything like this before, so my mind started racing with all of the possible explanations of what I could have been looking at. We sat there staring out the window for about ten seconds or so, trying to make sense of what we had just seen when suddenly from behind us came this loud bang and it shook the entire car. My friend who was driving slammed on the brakes and we all turned around to see that the back window of the car was shattered. But there was no reason for that to have happened. We weren't near anything that could have caused it to break. No falling trees or flying rocks, and there was no wind outside. I remember being terrified and thinking how weird it was that we simultaneously were looking at this strange animal, and at the same time our back window basically explodes. I looked again into the trees, but super scared of actually seeing anything again. But it was gone. Worse yet, I kept thinking about how the sun was starting to go down, and... We knew that it would get dark very quickly after that. My friends and I were totally unable to make sense of what was happening, so we decided to just drive up a little further before we checked anything out, in case whatever we had been looking at came back out again. We definitely did not want that to happen. We drove maybe another quarter of a mile up the road before pulling over to the side and getting out of the car and assessing the damage. The back window was completely shattered but there were no pieces of glass inside the car because the window was still sort of intact. I guess that's a safety thing on cars. Looking at the windshield all cracked like that, it was a big awakening to us, even though I think we probably had it in our minds that we could originally continue on to the campsite, we unanimously decided that it was best if we just drove back home and forgot about the whole overnight thing. So we turned the car around in the middle of the road and headed back down towards where everything had taken place. We had no choice but to go back that way if we wanted to go home, unfortunately. So then as soon as we got back to the area where we saw the creature, my friend yelled, There it is! I squinted and looked up ahead of us into the trees, but there was this huge rock on the side of the road. I originally thought that he had meant he had seen the creature again and was yelling about that, but he said, No, look at the rock! That's what hit us. We stopped the car to look at it. The rock was huge. No one could have ever lifted that thing that I knew of and thrown it the way it came at us. We all just looked at each other in disbelief, but quickly continued driving away. We didn't say much to each other after that. We were all in shock. Honestly, the rock looked like it could have weighed a 100 pounds, and it would have had to have been hurled from quite a distance. So thinking about the thing that we had just seen moments earlier made me believe that whatever it was, was stronger than I wanted to think. I mean, to be able to pick up that rock and throw it at our car? As I was thinking about all of that, suddenly to our right, something in the woods caught our attention and we all yelled. We were definitely on edge. We quickly turned our heads in the direction to see what it was, but we were sure to keep the car going this time. And again we saw the huge creature. And it appeared to be bipedal and running on two legs, just like the first time. But this time it was darker outside, and we could now see large, glowing eyes. And again, its arms were swinging back and forth as it ran. Obviously, we had never seen anything like this before this day, and now twice. So our minds were racing with the possible explanations. Our brains were trying to make logical sense out of all of it. But whatever it was had already disappeared back into the woods again. This time, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that whatever we had seen both of these times was definitely not human. There was no stopping us from going home now. We drove as fast as we could down the road. We didn't want to be near those woods at all. And I'm pretty sure that whatever was in there obviously did not want us there or anywhere in the area. 
As we drove away, I couldn't help but wonder what else might be out there in those woods waiting to be discovered, or if there were more than one of what we saw. Because thinking of how that rock came at us from behind, I sort of think there was more than one. When we got home, we didn't tell our parents or anyone else what had happened. I personally was scared and didn't want to be made fun of or ridiculed by anyone. But I still think about that day. I think about it often, and I wonder. I've never seen anything like it since, thank goodness. But I can say with 100% conviction that whatever it was was definitely not a human figure. Do you think that there are creatures like this? Like this one, waiting to be discovered? What do you think this creature was? Please let me know so I can get some rest. West Virginia, 2002. I'm going to tell you about the strange events that happened in my small town. It all started on a summer evening in June of 2002. Our town, which is nestled amongst the rolling hills of West Virginia and surrounded by dense forests, was known to be peaceful. The locals were friendly and life seemed to flow at a relaxed pace. However, little did we know that everything about that summer was about to change. I was a young kid at the time, about 12, and so I spent most of my days playing outdoors with my friends. We would often explore the woods, looking for hidden treasures or secret hideouts. But one day, we overheard the adults whispering about strange sightings in the area. They talked about a creature from local lore known as the Mothman, a mysterious being with large red eyes and black wings. At first, we didn't think too much about it, but the stories persisted and curiosity got the better of us, so we started listening more and more. Eventually, we got so interested and naively decided to take off on an adventure to figure out the truth behind the Mothman. That evening, as the sun was setting, we gathered near an old oak tree at the edge of town. We each told our parents we were headed to a different friend's house. Armed with flashlights and excitement and fear, we ventured into the nearby forest. The dense leaves cast eerie shadows, and the rustling created an atmosphere that scared us all to death. But at the time, we were too chicken to tell each other how scared we were. We treaded cautiously our eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of the creature. The wind was wisping through the trees, and every crackle of a branch made us jump. That night we only searched for fifteen minutes or less, all telling each other we were tired when really we were terrified. Little did we know that our encounter was eventually going to become a chilling reality. As days turned into weeks, the reports of Mothman stories, even sightings, in our town, continued to grow. People claimed to have caught glimpses of its silhouette soaring through the moonlight sky, its eyes glinting ominously. The atmosphere in the town was mixed with fear and fascination, and we kids couldn't help but overhear all of the conversation. One evening, while sitting on my porch and looking up at the sky, I noticed a peculiar movement near the town's abandoned mill. A dark figure emerged from the shadows its wings outstretched, resembling a giant moth. My heart raced, and I realized it was the Mothman. I ran in the house and called my friends. We all made a plan to head to the old mill. As we cautiously approached the area, we all started to hear and feel a loud humming, sort of a buzzing sound. We stopped and looked, and before we knew what was happening, we watched as the Mothman took flight, from a tree off to our right. Its powerful wings created a gust of wind that made it difficult to stand, and we watched in awe as it circled above us, its eyes glowing eerily in the moonlight. It seemed to be watching us, studying our every move, until flying off into the distance. The sight was completely terrifying, leaving us horrified, and knowing that without a doubt we should not have come here. We all ran back to our respective homes as fast as we could. From that night forward, our town was plagued with unexplained phenomena. Strange lights flickered in the sky. Eerie sounds could be heard through the night. People reported vivid nightmares, and they were increasingly becoming afraid to go outside. 
Driven by a mixture of young stupidity, determination, and fear, my group of friends and I then devised a plan to find the Mothman. So we gathered at the outskirts of town. The moon was high and bright, casting a strange glow on us as we prepared to face the creature. As we ventured into the forest, our hearts were pounding. The atmosphere was heavy with anticipation. And then we saw it. The Mothman emerged from the darkness with its wings spread wide, filling the air with a sense of foreboding and almost death. Summoning every ounce of bravery within us, we chanted for it to leave, hoping we could call it away, banish the creature. It screeched, flickering in and out of our sight, and it felt like we were fighting a battle between light and darkness. The air crackled with energy and the wind howled through the trees as if nature itself knew what was happening. And then with a final surge, the creature let out a haunting cry, flapped its wings, and retreated. Slowly we watched as it faded into the night, leaving a silence behind. To this day, our small town carries the scars of what happened that June. People still tell the story of the Mothman to new generations, to remind them that there's a balance between what we know and what we don't. I'm not sure that what my group of friends did was what actually made the Mothman leave, but either way, we like to think that we had some part of it. Just remember, sometimes the most extraordinary and terrifying experiences can teach us the most valuable lessons. This happened in the summer of 2007. I was a city worker for a town out on the East Coast. I don't want to drop any names since this really isn't something I should be talking about. The town I worked for was a pretty big tourist destination in the summer and fall. We were near enough to the ocean to bring in quite a crowd for the summer months. There was a decent-sized lake on the edge of town that was a frequent destination for tourists. However, that year there had been some strange sightings around the lake. The first reports were of giant birds sitting on the water's edge, preventing people from entering the lake. And then the story changed to bird men, like humanoid figures with wings. No one ever saw these things up close. They would describe the silhouette of the creature as either a giant bird or a bird man. In all the stories, the creature had yellow eyes and would block people from getting to the lake. Sometimes it wandered around the lake. Sometimes it stopped cars along the road to the lake, but no one ever saw its face. It was so much of a problem that the police were called to investigate multiple times. The logical theories were that it was either a large territorial bird or some weirdo in a costume. The illogical theories were that it was either the Mothman, a bird-human hybrid, a ghost, or some kind of demon. I leaned towards the weirdo in the costume theory. That's what the two police officers thought as well when I talked to them about it. However, some further developments would take place that would make me change my tune entirely. It was getting late in summer, and I had not yet seen the creature. The lake that was once a popular recreation area was practically empty. Whatever the creature was, it was doing a great job at scaring people away. It was terrible for the town that relied on the income from tourists, but I thought I would use the opportunity to take my two kids to spend some time at the lake. It wasn't often that we get the lake all to ourselves. It was about three o'clock when we left for the lake. Part of me wanted to see the creature because I was one of the few locals who hadn't. At this point, I was convinced that it was some person in a costume, so I wanted to see how believable the costume really was. It was deathly quiet when we got to the lake. That was the first thing I noticed. No sounds of birds, no frogs, no insects even. It was the strangest thing. I definitely felt that something was wrong, but it wasn't something I could quite put my finger on. I heard some rustling in the trees above me, but when I turned to look, there was nothing to be seen. I thought I saw a black shadow move past me, but I couldn't tell for certain. My kids just looked at me. They knew there was something going on here too, but they didn't say anything. We walked down to the edge of the lake, and that's when we saw it. The creature. It looked like the shape of a man, maybe five-ish feet tall. 
and it had wings where the arms should be. The creature was entirely black, its face and its body. But that was not the strangest part. It was standing in the middle of the lake, standing on the water, but it didn't have its wings raised. It was just standing there, like it was floating or something. I was so fixated on the creature that I didn't notice what was right in front of me. There were several dead fish floating in the water, and more fish had washed up on shore. A few dead songbirds were on the beach, too. There was something terribly wrong here. I took my kids and ran back to the car. We went out for ice cream, and I didn't say another word about what we had seen. But since I work for the city, I did some digging when I got to work on Monday. I went back to the lake with a couple of co-workers, and we ran some water quality tests. We did not see the creature that day, but I have no doubt that it was there somewhere. And here's where it gets even weirder, as if it wasn't weird enough. We found out that the local company was dumping some severely toxic waste in a river that fed into the lake. The pollution levels were off the charts, and it was poisoning the fish and the wildlife. It was a huge deal when the public found out, and it took a few years to finally restore the lake. The creature sightings continued to happen around the lake until the pollution cleaned up. I don't know exactly what the Birdman was, but I'm pretty sure it was there to warn people to stay out of the water. It disappeared after the lake was cleaned and restored, and we haven't seen it since. I was hesitant to tell my story because it sounds crazy, but I hear other people having encounters just like this, and I think that these things are not necessarily out to get us. They have some purpose, and if you ever see one, check your surroundings. It might be trying to tell you something. So here's something wild for you guys. This happened to me a few years back, and I swear to this day, it still has me all kinds of twisted up. I've been listening to some of the stories here, and it's just wild how many folks have had these out there experiences. Makes me feel less like I'm losing my mind. Now, I've always been a city kid, born and raised in New York City, but I've had this lifelong fascination with the ocean. I always loved the water the fish, all that stuff. Right out of high school, I figured I'd take a year off before heading to college and just travel around and see some of the world, maybe get a bit of that ocean action I had been craving. A lot of my buddies were planning to study business or computer science or something, but that was never my scene. I was all about the outdoors, the wild and free, you know. So I'm doing this road trip down the coast, just me and my beat-up old car, and I hit Florida. Man, it was like a dream. The sun, the sand, the sea, the whole deal. That's when I found out about this thing they have, these marine conservation volunteers. Basically, you get to spend your day out on the water helping take care of the ocean. It was right up my alley, so I signed up without a second thought. Turns out, I was pretty good at it. I had a knack for the work and the ocean. It felt like home. After my year was up, I decided to stick around. I got myself trained up, and I ended up landing a gig as a marine conservation officer. It was like a dream come true. Now a big part of the job was keeping an eye on the local marine life. Dolphins, manatees, even sharks. And don't even get me started on the sea turtles. It was awesome. I'd start my day about sunrise, head out to the boat, and just cruise, watching the water and keeping an eye out for any trouble. So one morning, I was out on the boat, and I saw something weird. There were a bunch of seagulls squawking and flapping around, which isn't that unusual, but they were out in the middle of the water, nowhere near the beach. It was weird enough that I decided to check it out. As I got closer, I saw that they were hovering around this big patch of seaweed. Now seaweed out here isn't anything to write home about, but this was different. The seagulls were going nuts over it, diving down and pecking at it like something was in there. I decided to get a closer look, and that's when I saw it. This thing just kind of blended in with the seaweed. It was huge with this big, round head that looked almost fishy. It was bald, no hair, just this shiny, scaly skin. 
It was standing upright in the water, and I swear it must have been six or seven feet tall. It was a ways off, but I could see it clear as day. It had this dark, grayish skin like a shark, and when it turned to look at me, I nearly fell out of the boat. This thing had these big, yellow eyes, like a cat's, and these sharp, pointed teeth, and when it saw me, it sort of shifted, like it was surprised that I had seen it. I've never been so scared in my life. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest like it was just about to burst open. And I felt this heavy dread, like something bad was about to happen. I don't know how to explain it. It was like a weight pressing down on my chest. For a few seconds, I was just frozen there, staring at this thing. And then I don't know what came over me, but I decided to just get the hell out of there. I turned the boat around and I gunned it. I did look back once and I saw it. It was moving away, diving under the water faster than any animal I've ever seen. I did end up calling it in, and a couple other officers showed up. They wanted to go out and check it out, but by then, the thing was long gone. They didn't even believe me, of course. Tried to tell me it was just a manatee or a big shark or something. But I know what I saw. Man, just thinking about it still gives me the creeps. I have no idea what that thing was, or what it was doing out there. All I know is, it was no ordinary creature. I still work out on the water, but let me tell you, I have never looked at the ocean the same way again. Bowling Green, Kentucky, September 1997. In the fall of 1997, a girl went missing in my town. I was 24 at the time, and my brother was a volunteer firefighter. He asked me to be part of one of the search parties the town organized to look for her. We spent days sweeping parks, abandoned lots, and the forests around town. As the days passed, the search parties got smaller. But I stayed with it, as did most of the people on my crew. We did second sweeps of the deeper forested areas, knowing that she would be harder to find out there. With fewer of us out there, we broke off alone, but we were usually within yelling distance of each other. And we also had walkie-talkies. One afternoon, about an hour before dusk, I spotted some weird marks. I was keeping an eye out for footprints, either child-sized ones or adult ones that might mean someone had brought her out here. But the tracks were not shoe prints. They looked like a bare foot, a huge footprint with marks at the toes, almost like claw marks. But the shape was decidedly human, and there were only two prints. Someone was walking upright, so it couldn't be an animal. I called another crew member over to take a look, and he was just as confused as I was. Since we couldn't rule out that they were human, although they were weird, we followed them. We followed them for what felt like miles into the woods. It was getting late and dark, but we didn't want to lose the marks overnight, in case it rained and they washed away. So we radioed for help and got one other person, an older guy in the department. He seemed even less convinced about the footprints, but agreed to follow them with us. At dusk, the footprints are definitely harder to see, even with flashlights. We had to slow down and search carefully. It was starting to seem less likely that someone had carried the girl this far, but we weren't ready to give up on the only lead that we had had so far. While we were stumbling around in the near dark, we started hearing strange sounds. Someone, or something, walking and stepping on twigs and dry leaves. We called out, thinking that it might be another member of the search party, but no one answered. We swung our flashlights around, but we still didn't see anything. Sounds continued, and I thought about the marks. Whoever left them might still be out there with us, and it could be someone dangerous considering the circumstances. The three of us stood back to back looking into the forest. I had a small knife with me and the flashlights were heavy duty, but they weren't exactly any kind of a weapon. Finally, we saw a shape approaching. It was just a tall shadow walking towards us, slowly and awkwardly. We called out some more, asking the thing to identify itself but it didn't answer. And as it got closer, I noticed that the shape was all wrong. This thing was wider than a human, and the head was way too big. 
and it was slightly hunched over, and the legs were bent backwards, almost like a dog, although he was walking upright. We pointed all three flashlights at the thing and pretty quickly could tell that it was not a man. Also, that it had almost certainly made the tracks that we were following. It was on two feet and had a vaguely human shape, but the rest of it was some kind of canine, especially the chest and the head. It was covered in thick fur and its face looked more dog than human. It had a pointed face and ears that stuck straight up Its mouth was open, and saliva dripped from its very sharp-looking teeth. It slowly stepped towards us, never looking away, staring straight into our eyes. The eyes were glowing faintly in the dark. We backed away as it advanced, moving back the way we had came. It didn't change its pace, and neither did we. At least until it howled and lunged, and then we took off running. It took us a long time to get out of those woods. It was dark. We were panicked. We got lost a few times. Occasionally, one of us would think that we saw the creature and we would start running again. It was absolute chaos, actually. Eventually, we made our way out of the forest and we called the police. While we waited for them to arrive, we planned what we would tell them. All we could agree on was that it was some kind of half-man, half-dog beast. But we knew that that would sound ridiculous, and no one would believe us so we planned on saying that we had just followed human footprints deep into the forest, and that we believed that the person who took the little girl had made them. The police obviously arrived, and they agreed to send a team the next day, and to follow our instructions to where we had lost the footprints. After a full day's search, though, they returned, saying that they couldn't find anything suspicious. They also didn't say anything about a dog creature, either and two days later, the girl was found alive. She had wandered off and gotten lost in the thick trees. It was a miracle that she was even alive, especially when I think about what we saw. We made some general reports to animal control about a wild dog in the woods, but they didn't take that very seriously. And to this day, I can't explain what I saw in there and how that girl survived, but I've never gone back in those woods. And I never will. Tennessee, summer 2022. I'm not sure how to tell this story in any way that anyone will believe. As far as I know, I'm the only person to have ever come across this creature. Nobody I've ever talked to has ever heard of the thing. And I can't find anything online anywhere where it's run in with anyone else. I still know what I saw, though. I saw it plainly with my own eyes and in broad daylight, so there's no way I confused it with anything else. Let me back up a minute. I'm a longtime lover of your show, and I tune in regularly from my home in Arkansas. This story, though, takes place a little east of home on Real Foot Lake in the northwestern corner of Tennessee. I love to fish, and I was out on the lake one day last summer trying my hardest to hook a couple of big catfish. I wanted to catch them for a fish fry that I had promised my brothers, who had promised to come and visit me next weekend. The fish finder on my boat was telling me that there were several large fish swimming directly underneath me. So even though it was the hottest part of the day, and I was hungry and thirsty and about out of ice water, I wasn't moving until I had at least one or two caught. It was sweltering hot that day, and I was all alone out on the boat. In fact, I hadn't seen another boat in well over an hour by the time I saw what I saw. I grabbed the last bottle of ice water I had out of the cooler and I took a seat at the front of the boat. I casted out my line and sat quiet, waiting for a tug on the line. As I wiped the sweat off my brow, though, something came up and bumped the underside of the boat. It wasn't a hard bump, but hard enough to nearly knock me out of the seat and definitely hard enough that I felt the need to scoot over and look down into the water to try to figure out what it was. At my first glance, I couldn't see anything. I gave up scanning the water for something big, and I went back to my seat to take another swig of ice water. I figured it must have been a tree just underneath the water's surface that I had passed over, or maybe one of those big catfish that were taunting me from down below. 
Just as I was almost sat back down, though, there was another major bump under the boat. This time I dropped my water bottle, spilling the last of it out onto the bottom. As you can imagine, this made me frustrated, so I went back to the boat's edge to search again. This time, I was committed to finding the culprit, even if it was hard for me to see. I decided to grab one of the oars and push around under the boat a minute to see if I could get anything to come up. When I stuck the oar under the boat, though, something grabbed onto it tight, only for a second or two, and then I pulled the oar back up to find that the entire paddle of it was missing. Whatever was under my boat had bit the thing clear in two. This is about the time I decided to go ahead and start the motor to get the hell out of there. I couldn't imagine what it might be. My initial thought was that some Tennessee wacko had cut loose a pet alligator or something. The motor turned over only once before it died. I tried again, and it died again. The third time I couldn't get it to turn over at all. I pulled the propeller up out of the water to see if something was stuck, and I found that all of the blades were either broken off or bent. If it was an alligator down below, then it had skin as thick as concrete to do all that damage. I picked up my phone to call for help, and that's when the damn thing started to come up for air. Under my boat. And I'm not kidding you on this. There was a snapping turtle at least 15 feet wide. Well, it looked like a snapping turtle to me, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. Its head was about as big as my torso. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was right there in front of me. I was so frightened that this thing was going to tip over the boat. And then it submerged itself back into the water, and the boat was about to tip over from the current of this thing submerging itself. I took out my other oar and I got myself to shore. It took me a while to work my way back to shore with only one oar and no motor. And keep in mind, it was hot as hell that day. I was so dehydrated by the time I got to shore. In the end, none of my friends believe me, but I swear that that is what I saw. Green Mountain National Forest, Vermont, 2013. I have always had a deep appreciation for nature and the great outdoors. Hiking through the dense, untamed wilderness has become a passion of mine. There's something incredibly peaceful about being surrounded by towering trees, the scent of damp earth filling the air, and the symphony of wildlife echoing through the forest. This particular weekend, I decided to embark on a solo hiking trip to the remote Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. The moment I stepped foot into the forest, a sense of tranquility washed over me. I breathed in the solitude and the opportunity to disconnect from the chaos of daily life. As I ventured deeper into the woods, a sense of excitement and anticipation bubbled within me. I followed a narrow trail the sunlight barely penetrating the canopy overhead. The further I went, the denser the foliage became, obscuring the path ahead. But I moved on. I had come prepared for this adventure. After a while, I noticed something peculiar amidst the undergrowth, a set of massive footprints imprinted on the forest floor. My heart quickened as I realized the enormity of these prints each print was at least three times the size of a regular human's foot. The realization sent a shiver down my spine, but my curiosity got the better of me. I couldn't resist the urge to follow these mysterious tracks. Cautiously, I followed the footprints deeper into the forest with my eyes scanning the surroundings for any sign of movement. The atmosphere grew increasingly eerie, and an unsettling smell hung in the air. A combination of wet dog, garbage, and something else I couldn't quite place. The forest seemed to hold its breath as if it was aware of an unseen presence lurking within its depths. The rustling of leaves and distant snapping branches intensified my anticipation, and it heightened my senses. My heart pounded in my chest as I forged ahead determined to find the source of the mystery. Little did I know that I was about to experience a series of chilling encounters, encounters that would forever alter my perception of the natural world. Suddenly a sharp crack echoed through the forest. 
followed by a sound that sent a chill down my spine. The sounds reverberated in a way that was not a normal sound for a forest. My heart raced, and I instinctively froze, straining my ears to catch any further sound. And then a growl, deep and menacing, reverberated through the trees. It was unmistakably non-human, a primal warning that seared deep inside me. The tension in the air escalated as I continued, now acutely aware that I was not alone. The snapping of branches and rustling of leaves seemed to taunt me, always staying just out of sight. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, of eyes peering at me from the shadows. The forest, seemingly serene just moments before, had now transformed into a sinister cluster of trees that made no sense to me. I knew I was going to lose daylight soon. It would cast long shadows in the trees. So I quickened my pace, my heart pounding in my chest, and suddenly a piercing yelp shattered the silence, piercing through the forest like a warning siren. It was followed by a cacophony of otherworldly whooping noises that echoed through the night. Panic surged within me as I realized I had unwittingly stumbled into the domain of something far more formidable than I could have imagined. Pushing forward, I followed the trail of broken branches and disturbed foliage, evidence of a powerful creature recently passing through, my eyes revealing glimpses of twisted and gnarled trees surrounding me. And then, as if the forest itself was guiding me, I stumbled upon a hidden opening, a cave nestled within a cluster of moss-covered rocks. I could feel a strange energy emanating from its depths, almost beckoning me to come closer. I hesitated, my mind still raging between curiosity and caution, but I steadied my breath, and I cautiously entered the mouth of the cave. Inside, the air was thick with an earthy musk and an inexplicable sense of ancient power. My flashlight danced across the cave walls, revealing remnants of a makeshift lair with twigs and leaves scattered on the ground. Remnants of fires, an unmistakable stench of wet fur. It was a sanctuary fit for a creature of immense strength. As I ventured into the cave, my heart thudded against my ribcage. I couldn't slow it down no matter how hard I tried. Shadows danced on the walls in a way that clearly told me I was out of my element in here. My footsteps echoed through the cavern, and then as if under the control of some other force, my flashlight flickered off, plunging me into complete darkness. Panic seized my chest and I fumbled in my bag for a lighter even though I knew I never carried one. But I was desperate for even the smallest flicker of light and then the deafening silence shattered. A thunderous growl echoed on every wall of the cave, sending vibrations through my bones. The ground even shook beneath my feet as this massive figure materialized from the shadows. Towering at least ten feet tall, its body was a testament to raw power and untamed wilderness. Covered in coarse, matted hair, it possessed a primal type of aura that somehow demanded my respect and attention. The creature's beady eyes met mine, and for a fleeting moment, time stood still. I watched as its lips curled into a snarl, revealing glistening teeth, and with that, an air of danger permeated the cave. Luckily, in that moment, my survival instincts kicked in, and I could feel my body slowly backing away, matching its intense gaze. With each cautious step, I could feel the creature's scrutiny, its unwavering stare at my every movement. And then, with one final yelp, the beast retreated into the shadows, disappearing into the darkness from where it came. I exhaled a shaky breath, grateful for the opportunity to leave with my life intact. As I stumbled back into the forest, the weight of the encounter pressed on me, harder with each exiting step. The enigma of the creature I saw remains with me to this day, forever etched in my memory, in a way that I cannot seem to get away from. I beg of you to please take this as a warning, a testament to the truth, that mysteries do lay hidden within the depths of our natural world. 
Appalachian Trail, Virginia, 2017. So there I was, deep into the Appalachian Trail near the border of Virginia and West Virginia. I'd been hiking for about two weeks at this point and was planning on about another two, if all went well. Now I've been on a ton of hikes, but this one, this one was something else. It was about mid-May and the chill of the early spring was still lingering, especially once the sun went down. But the scenery was breathtaking, honestly, with the mountains just beginning to shake off the winter blues. The trees were budding and the air was thick with the earthy scent of spring. Anyway, I'd been hiking about five hours that day when I decided to set up camp near a small brook. There's something about the sound of running water that soothes me when I sleep. It's peaceful, tranquil, or at least it's supposed to be. I eventually got everything set up and was settling down for the night, the fire crackling nearby when I heard this rustling in the bushes. Now, it wasn't the sort of rustling you would dismiss as a rabbit or a squirrel. No, this was louder, heavier. It sent a shiver down my spine. I remember thinking that maybe somebody else was out there, or maybe even a deer was moving along in its own trail. Sometimes animals can sound larger than they are. I tried not to think about it, but the noise continued and it continued in the exact same spot, just off the campsite. It wasn't getting fainter or moving along, so I grabbed my flashlight and I headed towards the noise. As I was getting closer, the rustling stopped, but I could feel something. It's hard to explain, but it was like I could feel eyes on me. This feeling of being watched was overwhelming, like I was on display. I shone my flashlight around, but there was nothing to see just trees and bushes in the blackness beyond my light. It was then, though, that I heard it. I might even go so far as to say I felt it versus heard it. A low growl. It was deep and guttural. I could feel it vibrate through the ground, shaking me to my core. In the pitch black, I felt a sense of dread like I was definitely in danger. My heart was racing and I was finding it hard to even breathe. My mind was yelling, get out of there. But my body, it wouldn't listen. But then something happened. This figure slowly emerged from the shadows. It wasn't just any figure. No, it was enormous, standing on two legs, silhouetted against the sparse moonlight. I felt my heart leap to my throat. I mean, we've all heard the stories, right? About Sasquatch or Bigfoot or whatever you want to call it, but to actually see one? Now you have to remember that the light wasn't the best. There was no real moon that night. But when my flashlight hit the thing, good lord, I could see that it was gigantic. I mean, it was tall, like really tall. I'd say easily eight or even nine feet. It towered above me, giving off this sense of pure, raw power that completely overwhelmed me. And it was broad, too. Very broad. Like its shoulders seemed as wide as a small car. No exaggeration. Its arms hung down almost to its knees, rippling with muscle under the hair that was matted and black, sort of blending with the shadows around. Its face, now that's something I will never forget. It was more human-like than ape-like, but still not quite human. Its eyes were large and expressive, shining in the light with an intelligence that startled me. The nose was flat, more like ours than a bear's or a wolf's. And its mouth, when it roared, I could see its teeth and even its breath as it exited its mouth in a slow stream of steam. Teeth were large, and they looked sharp, very sharp. It was a terrifying sight, the kind of thing you would expect to see in a nightmare, not on a peaceful hike in the Appalachian woods. Like I said before, the sound it made was a deep, rumbling growl that seemed to shake the very ground beneath me. There was like a rawness to it, primal sort of power that you can't really put into words. And then suddenly it let out another roar, and it echoed through the forest, 
making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And then it disappeared from the light of my flashlight. I swung the light slowly back and forth, trying to pinpoint the thing's current location. But I couldn't see anything at all. Just like that, I was alone again, standing there in the pitch black, heart pounding. That's when I realized that sweat was pouring down from my face and my chest. I hadn't even been aware of what was happening to my body until just then. As I'm sure you can imagine, I didn't sleep a wink that night. Every noise, every shadow had me on edge. I couldn't wait for day to break. So just as soon as the sun started peeking over the mountains, I packed up my stuff and I headed onwards. There was no real place to go but continue at this point. But I will tell you that I cut the hike short. I didn't make those full final two weeks. I just couldn't get over what had happened. Now I will tell you that since that encounter, I have been back to the Appalachian Trail since, but never to that same spot. I can't say I'd ever want to see that section of the trail ever again. I have this wild story to tell you. I was out in the middle of Illinois in a smaller little town called Crestwood. It's the kind of place where time seems to move a bit slower and everyone knows each other. But first, let me set the stage and give you a little backstory. I have always been fascinated by abandoned places and the stories that they hold. It's like stepping into a forgotten world and trying to piece together what once was. So when I heard about this old factory on the outskirts of Crestwood, I just couldn't resist. Rumor had it that this place was holding some kind of a secret, something strange and mysterious. And let me tell you, my curiosity got the better of me. Now the factory itself was a massive, crumbling structure, covered in vines and graffiti. It stood there like a relic from a bygone era, reminding you of the town's past. As I approached the entrance, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and apprehension. I mean, who knew what I was about to discover? But this was the part of this that I loved the anticipation of the unknown. I stepped inside and it was like stepping into another world. The air was thick with dust and the smell of decay. Sunlight filtered through the broken windows, casting eerie shadows on the decaying machinery. It was like a place frozen in time, abandoned and forgotten by the world outside. I loved it. As I ventured deeper into the factory, I stumbled on a room that seemed different from the rest. It was smaller, almost hidden away. And there, in the center of the room, was a table covered in papers and strange, unidentifiable objects. It was like somebody had left in a hurry, leaving behind secrets from long ago. Curiosity overwhelmed me, and I started to sift through the papers. There were sketches and diagrams, all detailing something that I couldn't quite understand. But what caught my eye were these tiny seeds, thousands of them in a jar. They were unlike anything I had ever seen before. Smaller, black, like the size of an acorn. And something about them was mesmerizing. I couldn't help but pocket a few of the seeds, thinking that they might be interesting all on their own. But as soon as I did, I felt a chill run down my spine, like my body was telling me that I had just made a big mistake. Suddenly I heard a noise, and it was this low clicking sound. I turned around, and that's when I saw it. A creature unlike anything that should even exist. It was tall, and its body was covered in this thick, black, oozing substance, almost like a creature come back from the dead. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and its limbs were long and sinewy. I froze, unable to move or even breathe. The creature moved towards me with its movements both graceful and predatory. I could feel its gaze piercing through me as if it was searching for something deep in my soul, and not in a good way. And then without warning, it lunged at me. As it did, time seemed to slow down. Its movements were fluid and precise, like a predator closing in on its prey. Its long, razor-sharp claws extended, ready to strike. 
and its teeth, sharp as daggers, were bared in this menacing snarl. I could feel its hot breath on my face, carrying a putrid stench that made my stomach churn. I snapped out of my shocked state, and my instinct kicked in. Adrenaline surged as I dove to the side, narrowly avoiding the thing crashing into me. And instead, it crashed into the table, sending papers and objects flying in all directions. The room shook with the impact as if the very foundations of the factory had been affected. I scrambled to my feet, heart pounding in my chest, and quickly assessed my surroundings. There had to be a way out of this nightmare. My eyes darted around, searching for an escape route, but the room seemed to have transformed and I didn't recognize anything. Shadows danced and twisted as if the walls were alive. The creature, recovering from its failed strike on me, let out this bone-chilling growl and its eyes glowed fixed on me, filled with this primal hunger. I knew I couldn't outrun this thing. This was its space. So I had to find a way to defend myself and find something, anything that could help me survive. Desperation fueled my actions, and I scanned the room for a weapon, my gaze landing on a broken pipe laying amidst the wreckage of the desk. It was a slim chance, but it was all I had. I grabbed it, and I prepared to face the creature head on. As the creature advanced again, a flicker of determination replaced my fear. I stood my ground, holding the pipe tightly in my hands. The air crackled with tension, my heartbeat pounding in my ears. I could see the creature's muscles tense, ready to pounce once more. But just as it launched itself towards me, a sudden explosion shook the room from the floors above. I couldn't fathom what it could be but also I couldn't focus on it if I wanted to get out of there alive. The sound made the creature flinch. Seizing that opportunity, I swung the pipe with all my might aiming for its head. The sound of the impact echoed through the chamber as the pipe connected, but it was like hitting a solid wall. The creature staggered for a moment, disoriented, before swiftly retaliating with a swipe of its claws. Pain seared through my arm as its claws reached me, leaving deep gashes. I gritted my teeth, refusing to let it overwhelm me. Blood was dripping. I knew that. But I also knew I had to keep fighting and keep pushing forward. With a surge of determination, I mustered every ounce of strength and I delivered another blow, this time aiming for the creature's midsection. The pipe struck true, and a guttural roar erupted from the creature's throat. It staggered backward, momentarily weakened. But our battle was far from over. The creature's eyes burned with a fiery intensity as it regained its composure. It then circled me, wary and calculating. I knew it was ready to strike again. I, too, readied myself for the next round, knowing that only one of us would emerge from this life-and-death struggle. Just as the creature lunged for its next attack, a shaft of intense sunlight beamed down through a hole in the ceiling. I could see that the creature's skin began to smoke and sizzle and a horrible screech escaped its lips. It recoiled and shielded its eyes and growled in pain. It was weak to the sunlight. Having found the creature's vulnerability, I knew I had a chance. As the creature retreated further into the shadows, I sprinted towards the beam of sunlight, positioning myself directly under it. Now I was in a much more advantageous position, and the creature would have to pass through the sunlight to get to me. It wouldn't happen. So now with this ability to see and assess the room and stand there safely, I was able to see an exit. And now with the creature disabled by the light, I made my move. I ran for the door and out the building and into more sunlight. I knew I had just escaped a near-death experience. And yet my adrenaline was pumping and I couldn't help but feel a sense of exhilaration. I had just faced a creature of the unknown a relic hidden within the abandoned factory, and I had come out alive. I headed back into the town of Crestwood, which seemed to just carry on with its slow-paced life, oblivious of the adrenaline-filled adventure that had just transpired in the factory. I continued on with my life. I returned back home. To tell you the truth, I'm still at it. I'm still searching these abandoned locations, hoping to find something. But the truth doesn't escape me, that I narrowly escaped with my life that day. I share this to let you know 
that these things are out there. And just be careful where you go, unless you really know what's about to happen. This story is about this one time I was in Gila National Forest in New Mexico in 1992. Gila is the oldest and largest designated wilderness in the United States. And it's quite the wild place, too, teeming with all sorts of interesting critters. And I'm not just talking about deer and bear. Now you're all probably wondering why was I there. Well, I used to be a forest ranger. I loved the great outdoors and the smell of pine in the morning. One night, I would say about two years ago, I was doing my regular rounds. It was a full moon, skies were clear, and you'd think nothing could go wrong. But boy, was I in for a surprise. I heard this rustling in the bushes. Now, me being me, I thought it was probably just a fox, or maybe even a coyote. But then I saw this shadow, big, way bigger than any coyote, and it was slithering in a way that I could barely comprehend. Now I'm no coward, but this here, it was something else, and I was wanting to just hightail it out of there. But my curiosity, You know how that can be. Well, it got the better of me. I decided to investigate, but all quiet-like, right? So I tiptoe over to where I saw that shadow. My heart's beating in my chest like a rabbit caught in a snare. I get closer, and then I see it. This thing is no regular forest animal. Not by a long shot. It was massive, standing on two legs like a man but it was no man that I have ever seen, covered in head to toe in these shimmering green scales, and the eyes were glowing like two embers in the dark. It gave me shivers, for sure. Its hands, or rather claws, they were something out of a nightmare. They were long and razor sharp, and that tail was long and serpentine and the thing was twitching and coiling around like some kind of a snake. So I'm standing right there, right, frozen like a deer in the headlights, and this thing, it turns and looks right at me. I can see the moonlight glinting off of its scales, and for a moment, just for a moment, we lock eyes. Now you all might not believe me, but in that moment, I swear it felt like this creature was reading me like looking into my soul. And then it grunted, this deep, guttural sound that echoed through the trees. Now, I'm not too proud to say I was terrified, but still there was something fascinating about it, sort of like a car wreck that you can't look away from. So then I'm there looking at this monster straight in the eyes, and some part of me just wanted to run, to just turn and bolt, but I couldn't. I was stuck to the ground as if my boots had taken root. Suddenly the thing steps towards me, like real slow, each step sending a chill up my spine, but it didn't attack. It just stood there, sizing me up. And then out of nowhere it raises this claw thing. And now I thought this was it. I thought I was done for. But instead, it reaches out towards the moon, like it was trying to grab it right out of the sky. And I'm telling you, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen, like something straight out of a movie. And then the next thing I know, it turns back to me, still with its claw raised high, and it makes this sound, not a growl, not a grunt, but a hiss, a long, eerie hiss that makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And then without warning, it darts off into the darkness, leaving me alone with nothing but the echo of its hiss and the pounding of my heart. Now, I don't know about you all, but that was the most terrifying and yet fascinating thing I've ever experienced. I haven't been the same since. I don't think I'll ever be. I stood there for what felt like an eternity with my heart pounding, adrenaline coursing through my veins. And then the forest, which was so familiar to me, suddenly felt alien, like I was a stranger in my own backyard. Finally, I managed to move my rooted feet turning back towards the ranger station. 
I'm not sure why, but I didn't tell anybody about what happened that night. Maybe because I thought they would think I was crazy, or maybe just because I wanted to keep that to myself. I did go back to the spot the next day, and I found some strange tracks, nothing like I had ever seen before. And then I took some pictures for keepsake, you know. That night changed everything for me. In fact, I'm not a forest ranger anymore. I moved into town and I got a job at the local hardware store. But every time I look out towards those woods, I can't help but wonder about that creature, that reptilian beast out there in the wild. It's become sort of a legend in my own mind, my own personal monster right here in Gila National Forest. So there you have it. It's my story, as unbelievable as it may seem. Take from it what you will, but remember, next time you're out in the woods, keep your eyes open. You never know what you might encounter. New Mexico, 2021. I know that this last summer I encountered something paranormal and out of this world, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. My friend and his family are convinced it's a skinwalker, but I believe it was something else. I do know a little bit about skinwalkers and dogmen and Bigfoot, too, and I don't believe that what I encountered was everything that matches up to what a skinwalker is. My friend's family thoroughly believes that this was the spirit or being that represents a skinwalker. I believe it was some other cryptid, or potentially, at least, the spirit of one. Last July, I went and visited a close friend of mine who's native and lives on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. We've been friends for years and we met during a work retreat long ago. I thought I'd make a vacation out of it by going to visit him. I stayed with him at his trailer for about a week or so, and then we went to visit his family. His family is very enriched in Navajo culture and lore, and his mother especially can be very superstitious at times. But as of this event, I don't blame her for anything she believes or doesn't believe, or so I thought. My Navajo friend never really talked about skinwalkers or cryptids or anything like that. I guess I can't blame him since it's part of this culture not to talk about those things in fear of drawing them to you. I truly don't know how he felt about all that stuff because, well, he never really talked about it. When he met his family, which this was the first time, they're very nice and lovingly invited me into their home. His mom pulled me aside and warned me of her brother that had turned to the darker side of things and would sometimes appear around at night just to start trouble. I didn't really understand what she meant by that, and at the time I thought she was just referring to him being drunk or something, causing drama, so I left it at that. It's not like I haven't encountered my fair share of bumps before. I never really asked my friend about his family or anything like that. So to my knowledge, my friend's uncle was nil. We stayed there for a few nights and everything was as normal as you can get. On one of the nights, all of us were outside having a bonfire, talking, laughing, eating good food, just like we had the nights before. Then after a short time, my friend and his family began to get really quiet, and the laughing, good times and all, turned into a serious, stoic expressions on their faces. It was in that moment that I remember I could feel a shift in the mood and the tonality around us. I don't know how else to describe it to you, but that's the best way I can. My friend and his family spoke together in Navajo, in hushed tones, and I didn't understand a drop of that language. So I kept trying to interpret the tone and the demeanor as to what they were talking about. After everybody got quiet, my friend started talking to his family and they're very concerned. It was almost as if they were trying to conceal their voices from maybe not only me, but something else. My friend turns around and walks up to me and says, you need to go back inside the trailer right now. Confused, I thought we were having a good time, but he just keeps walking to the trailer and quickly keeps motioning for me to follow him. So I kind of just shrugged my shoulders, going along with whatever was happening. 
His dad was trying to put the fire out quickly, and his mom was rushing both me and my friend into the house. We got to the house, and his mom kept looking out the window, waiting for the dad to come back inside. The father goes in, grabs the gun, and all the doors and windows are locked thoroughly. Now I'm starting to freak out just a little bit because I wanted to know what was going on. Normally you wouldn't have fires out here at nighttime for fear that it could draw in terrible, terrible spirits. But I guess in this case, looking back, they had their whole property and family and house blessed, so they had weekly bonfires. Well, more like nightly since they didn't have to worry about those things. Or so I thought. My friend comes up to me and whispers in my ear that his uncle is outside and that it's going to cause problems. I looked at him strangely, and I asked if he was drunk, and that did we need to call the police. And that's when I heard it's super loud banging on the trailer. The mom and the father both shrieked, and the dad put his back up against the front door with a gun ready in his hands. At this point, I'm starting to freak the hell out because I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is feels ominous as hell. You could start to hear these heavy footsteps walking around the trailer outside and heavy breathing. It didn't sound human. Whatever it was, whoever it was, was pacing the trailer slowly as if looking for a weak spot to try and break in. That's what it felt like to me. And I was getting scared. Terrified, more likely. My friend and his family kept motioning to me to be quiet and just listen. And this went on for probably a good 45 minutes, if I had to guess. But it's hard to say because sometimes it feels like it's an eternity when you're in the moment. After a while, things got quiet for another little bit of time. Dad looked at us all and said we needed to leave the house now to be safe. He motions for all of us to run outside and jump in the old van and flee. Me, not knowing exactly what's going on, I'm kind of left with no choice but to just tag along and go with the flow. So, scaredy cat me runs out there with them and hops in the van. As his dad is basically throwing us in the back of the van, I hear the most horrifying screech or roar that I've ever heard from behind the trailer, just off a little ways in the darkness. It sounded like a mix of a bear crossed with a wolf, crossed with a dying woman being murdered. It sounded like it came from the pits of hell. I think that was the point in the night where I truly felt fear go down my spine. I knew I was in danger. My friend and his mom were pale, and then she started to cry and pray in Navajo. His dad is swearing in Navajo. He's trying to get the van to start. I think it was an old beater van that had problems with the ignition and had issues starting up sometimes. I think I do remember at one point, though, my friend mentioned that they needed to have the whole engine replaced, but they didn't have the money. Anyway, he gets the van going, and we're flying out of there onto the main highway. Now, at least at this point, remember it's nighttime. There aren't any lights around except for stars, and he's probably going close to 70 or maybe 80 miles an hour. He's flooring it, trying to get away from where we just were, and we are all quiet in the back. Nobody saying a word. And then my friend looks up and looks out the window of the back of the van, and he starts screaming and pointing and shouting at something. I look, and catching up with the van is the largest wolf I have ever seen. I guess I could call it that because it resembled a wolf, but it looked so much more evil. It's like a wolf that came from hell and had kind of a smoky vapor to it, if that makes any sense. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's almost like it had black smoke emanating from it, and it had glowing red eyes and large teeth like some sort of saber-tooth wolf or something, and it was massive. It was running on all fours and getting closer and closer to the van. We're all watching in horror, and then this thing just darts off to the right of the van and increases its speed to not only keep up with the van, but keep up on the driver's side window. And at this point, it's right next to the dad. He's still keeping up at 80 miles an hour. We are all screaming. And then his dad pulls off of a fork in the road that conveniently showed up. Thank you, Lord. 
Here, the road is a little bit more rough, but he decided to go down that way to try to ward off the thing or whatever was chasing us. While he starts going down this road, the next thing is that this thing just disappears. It's a more primitive road, but by primitive, I mean it still has concrete and stuff. It just isn't taken care of. So there are potholes and parts of the road that are severely cracked and damaged. So we go down this road for I don't even know how long, maybe an hour. But that might be a bit of a stretch. At one point, he just pulled over and parked the van in the middle of nowhere in the pitch black of night. And then he just sat there and started sobbing against the wheel. My friend and his mother didn't say a word. I'm not even sure what was going on. I'm trying to process what just happened, and there was some freakish demon wolf creature thing chasing the van. It was literally the size of a car. I kind of blacked out, to be honest. I felt like it was so traumatic that my brain just had to escape and register that I really wasn't in reality anymore. My memory's kind of fuzzy. So are the details. But I can tell you that we did sleep in the van that night. It wasn't comfortable. I can tell you that. But I think we were just so exhausted from sheer fear. I have no idea why it stopped following us and why his dad just pulled over on the side of the road, leaving us all vulnerable in my eyes. But whatever it was, we didn't see it after we pulled off. I remember opening my eyes and it was daylight, or at least just starting to see the sunlight come out with his dad standing outside of the van looking around. My friend and his mom were still asleep, and the dad then just hops back in the van, turns it on, and begins to turn back around to where their home was. I was exhausted and still terrified, but I didn't have the energy to ask what just happened. Somewhere along the way, my friend and his mom woke up, and we all just kind of sat there in silence, in trauma from the night before. At one point or another, we pulled back into their house, and we're all getting out of the van. When the dad and the mom walk up to the house and start talking nervously again, praying, dropping to their knees, there were deep scratches all over the house and the door. It looked like Kodiak bears tried to maul their trailer. It was bad. My friend's trying to talk calmly to his parents as best as he can, and they're both so worked up that they can't even think straight. My friend comes up to me, pulls me aside, and tells me we should leave that it's not safe to be here, at least not anymore. I wasn't going to argue or try to ask questions. I just went along with everything, gladly. In the last 12 hours, I felt my life had flipped upside down entirely. We left and the rest of the visit was not the same at all. My friend had completely shut down and didn't speak much. Fast forward a little bit and I was able to finally talk to him about what had happened. This is where things get a little creepy and I'm really starting to connect the dots. Turns out that my friend's uncle, at a young age, murdered his little brother. Or in this case, my friend's mother's youngest brother, who at the time was a small child. This in turn caused him to be banished and he took and turned to dark magic, becoming a skinwalker. They had a name for it, a name that they call it, but I can't remember it basically a skinwalker. Her brother became animalistic in nature, living in the wild and turning to evil. He'd tried to come back time to time to torment his sister and my friend's family, taking the shape of hideous beings and other animals. This is why they believed him to truly be a skinwalker. However, it gets more terrifying than this. That night in July, when we experienced what we did, it was later found out that her brother, who had turned to evil practices, committed suicide in a satanic ritual of sorts that same evening. This led to further speculation that this was the actual evil spirit who dwelled in his mom's brother, that it had come to enact revenge on the family for banishing him years before. That's what he and the family believes now. Why it stopped following us in the van after some time is also another interesting story. I guess it just so happens that not too much further down the road from where his dad pulled off lived a medicine man in the community who had much of the area blessed and had warded off dark spirits before in the past. This friend of mine 
who I won't name for his family's respect, claimed dark spirits were afraid of him, and the pieces started to connect more and more as time went by. Myself, I'm not really sure what to think or believe. I know their entire culture is very enriched in that sort of thing of warding off bad spirits, but this was on a whole other level. I don't think spirits or demons, call them whatever you will, could take physical form like what I saw and chase down a van at 80 miles an hour. I do watch creepy pasta stuff and things on Dogman, Bigfoot, etc. So to see this in real life was more than terrifying. It was as if I was in a horror movie. I don't have an answer for you, but it caused me to shut down for a few weeks until I could finally talk about it with my friend and get some closure on what exactly happened and why. Maybe it was the spirit that dwelled in his uncle that came and attacked us. I have no idea. My friend and his family had prayed heavily for me in Navajo since I was there so as not to attract any more of these things. They firmly believe that once you have a sighting with one of these, you become marked for more encounters. His parents had had their house blessed multiple times before this happened, in fear that her brother would return and seek revenge on her as he had tried before. My friend told me that this was the reason why this spirit or being wasn't able to enter their house, because it had been blessed by that medicine man. I know that skinwalkers and dark spirits are very much a part of Navajo and are very real. I couldn't imagine what it'd be like dealing with these things, though, on a normal basis. Anyway, I know that whatever chased down that van for as long as it did possessed supernatural powers in its own right. And I know that no flesh and blood being alone, or at least even an animal, could have ever done that. Southern Mississippi, 2017. I'd like to start this off with a little bit of background about me. I'm 30 years old, my name is William, and I have this, what you would call, sadistic love of the outdoors, hiking, and going into hard climates and places that aren't exactly easy to traverse. I've never been one to go into a half-mile loop, something easily doable. I like to climb mountains, go into thick, boggy swamps, any terrain that's pretty rough. Because of this, you will usually find things other people will never see, which sets up my story. Which, by the way, I have information to back up my story from the past, from things that I've learned from native culture. So here we go. I believe there's a turf war going on. Oh, and one last thing. I also do believe in cryptids. I've had Bigfoot encounters as well as Dogman encounters in the past, but I'll save those for another time. Anyway, as I was saying, I do believe there's a territorial turf war between cryptids, specifically in the southern point of Mississippi. You see, just a couple of years ago, I was hiking deep in the marshlands, actually right along the Pascagoula River, which is in very southern Mississippi. It's pretty much in the middle of nowhere, and this is where I saw the most horrible thing that I ever have, even more frightening than my dogman and Bigfoot encounters. This was almost night. It was pretty dark, but you could still see somewhat enough that I could see that what was happening in front of me was insane. It started off with screams and loud sounds which prompted me to follow. Off in the brush, I heard what sounded like screaming, not human screams, like a giant wolf or something like that, screaming in pain. It's hard to say exactly. It sounded like something distorted, like animal sounds together. I could also hear some sort of a hissing noise, almost like a dinosaur roaring. Sounds crazy, I know. But then I peeked through and I saw a scene straight out of a Hollywood horror movie. This large, black, dog-looking thing with sharp, pointed ears standing upright on two legs. It was massive, with bulging muscles, and it was being attacked by what I can only describe as half-human, half-Komodo dragon, I guess. The thing was very lizard-like. Whatever they were, they were about halfway in the water and fighting violently. And then in a split second, just by the sight alone, I knew that I was seeing a dog-man. 
and that it was fighting some sort of reptilian creature. And then this thing, this reptilian creature, reaches up in one quick motion and tears a part of the muscle off of its body, flesh included, leaving this gaping hole and blood was pouring out. The dogman creature screams in pain and lashes and bites down, tearing part of the shoulder open of the reptilian creature, even though it was covered in thick spikes and armor, or whatever it appeared to be. More like armor like an alligator, not literal metal and steel. The thing screamed and hissed. It continued to be this bloody brawl. I watched in horror for maybe 20 more seconds. I have to realize it was probably only that short, but time seemed too slow as I was watching the horror in front of me. They brawled for a few more seconds, and then like a shark ascending up to bite into a seal, this thing jumped up and bit and tore out the throat of the dogman creature, causing the dogman to fall all the way back and fully submerge into the water, where this creature that looked far more like a dragon and an alligator and a human in one but more like a Komodo dragon, grabbed its body and pulled it underneath. There was blood. I was so terrified watching this. I figured now was my only chance to escape. So I turned around and as quietly and as quickly as possible, I ran back to where I had hiked from. If you want to verify my sighting yourself, I parked along Old River Road. It's still southern Mississippi, but a little bit north, and the Pascagoula River runs all through there. The brush is pretty thick, so good luck trying to traverse through it. After having three other separate dogman encounters, which I will send to you now that I think about it, I knew what a dogman was and what it looked like. I also knew how smart and how powerful they are, what they're capable of. By the way, both of these creatures, or cryptids as you call them, are incredibly large and very powerful. This dogman was no wimp. Easily eight or nine feet tall, slender in the legs, but very muscular in the arms and the chest. In fact, it looked a lot like one of the other dogmen that I saw in Texas once. But that's another story. As far as the reptilian creature, it just flat out looked freaky. It looked wrong, and kind of reminded me of something you would see if you were going to hell. Evil. Sinister. The way it had its spines on its back, and the way it resembled a human an alligator, and very prominently a Komodo dragon all in one. It was just frightening to look at, and it was also just a bit taller than the dogman. Probably not by several feet, though, but it seemed to be a little bit larger and was much more thicker and built like a tank. While this lizard thing appeared to take physical damage, too, it just seemed to have the upper hand and have more power than the dogman. But the dogman did put up a good fight, once it had fully submerged into the water very quickly with the corpse of the dogman. I didn't stick around to see what was going to happen. I booked it out of there and was happily gone. In fact, the entire thing seemed so surreal, it doesn't even feel like it actually happened, to tell you the truth. Seeing something like that is like seeing a hyena and a lion fight in the wild. Yeah, it happens. There's documentation of it but it's rare. And not too long after, you started releasing stuff on reptilian creatures that nobody else was talking about, like alligator men living in the swamps of the South. Although nothing you released or talked about sounds exactly similar to what I saw, the lizard creature, you're kind of in the same ballpark with the alligator man thing. An apex lizard-like predator that's half human, half lizard, is definitely here in the swamps. This thing looked more like a horrible, cryptid, genetic experiment than anything else, which leads me to believe that there's probably cryptids all over the United States. Flying, reptilian, dog, possibly cat. Because I've heard of people talk about werebears and werecats. Although I have nothing to say about them, never seen them or heard stories about them personally, of course. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's cryptids of all variety. Naturally, it would make sense that they would have territory wars or come into squabbles here and there, which I can't believe I happened to come and see. But had I not heard the screaming and all the commotion, I wouldn't have even bothered to actually come and see what it was. I would have just stayed in the trees. However, 
there is some evidence to support what I saw does actually happen when people don't even realize it. For example, I heard a Bigfoot story a while back that somebody, forgive me because I don't remember the location, they were up in the mountains, possibly the Sierra Nevadas in California, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, they had witnessed from a distance two Bigfoots fighting to the death. One Bigfoot eventually overpowered the other, grabbed a large rock and bashed the other. There was also another one where another person had seen two dogmen fighting, where the more dominant one, believed to be the alpha male, tore out the throat of a similar one. So right then, we do know these things do exist. And not only exist, but these wars between them also happen. And then in native culture, even, there's talk. I'm talking about the Plains Indians here. There are talks about their tribes going to war with the Dogman and the Bigfoot, and the Bigfoot and Dogman also warring against each other. Before I wrote this story out to send to you, I tried to educate myself as much as I could, listening to many of your episodes just to see if I could find the creature that I saw, that maybe somebody out there would also describe it as I saw it, but no. So this also makes me theorize that maybe there are different varieties of these reptilian creatures. Maybe reptilians that are shapeshifters take the form of people, just as you've talked about in some of your episodes where people see people with reptilian eyes who I believe are disguised as humans. And then you have the more cryptid creature side of it, where you actually see tall reptilian creatures, half man, half dinosaur, I've heard descriptions of them, which might be the closest relation to what I saw, although I prefer Komodo dragon because it looks more like that than, say, a dinosaur. And then other people, which is the most common, have talked about a half-man, half-alligator, which I already mentioned. So that seems to be the most common. Then, of course, you have these large reptilian creatures that look like lizards. There's also talks about tunnels and burrows being dug in the swamps. So if I'm totally honest with you, the more and more I listen, the more I've experienced, the swamps are just sounding like a less and less safe place to be, to visit, to hike around, to thrash around in and explore. I myself would not want to be caught off guard and attacked by either of these cryptids or reptilian things in the swamps. For all I know, it's their territory, and it has been for a very long time. On the other side, there also seems to be a ton of encounters and sightings, and not even in just the New Orleans area, but everywhere around Mississippi, too, the state that I'm currently residing in. And that's scary. But again, it would support the evidence that there's a clear territorial war. If you're not around in the deep parts of the marsh and the swamp, you're never even going to know what truly goes on. Just like when animals do get out in the middle of the wilderness, you would never know. As frightening as this really is, it's apparent that we're dealing with two apex predators here, both far more intelligent, larger, faster, and more powerful than any of us. I really believe we're no longer in the top of the food chain. We've been clearly outmatched. And I feel it's time to learn our place. If these things are going to have territory wars, who knows how long it's going to go on? And ultimately, who knows how long it's been going on for? If the natives of the plains have talked about it, there might be a war between all of them that we don't even realize. I don't think this is anything we want to get into the middle of. Looking back on that moment when I saw those creatures, it felt like it lasted forever, or that time had come to a slowdown. I regret not having my phone because I felt like I was in a moment where I could have captured it, but I left most of my stuff back in the car. Considering during hiking and walking around, I like to get as deep into the thick of it as I can, away from the modern world as much as possible. The sounds were incredibly loud. The decibels and the volume were easily the sounds of elephants fighting. I mean, loud. It clearly got my attention. I didn't recognize the noises or at least the style in which the noises were happening. The hissing and the growling and the howling didn't make sense at first. So I was pretty much obligated to check it out. 
In the end, this experience sure has really made me reevaluate where I choose to explore, where I choose to go hiking, and when and where. I don't want to end up running into something else's territory, especially if it's a violent cryptid or territorial creature. You just can never know anymore, not after what I saw, and not after my several violent experiences with these things. Peace be with you all. Sierra Nevada Mountains, California, 2022. It was the summer of 22, and I'm up in the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California, a place that I'd been looking forward to hiking for, like, forever. I had driven in from Colorado, and this was it for me. A hike of a lifetime. I had prepared all my gear the previous night, double-checking everything. Water, food, tent, map, the whole shebang. I was just itching to get out there and explore. So there I am, bright and early, ready to hit the trail. The sun's peeking up over the horizon, and it's just so serene. Anyway, a few hours into the hike, I stop to refuel, take a bit of a breather. I find this little nook near a stream, and I tell you, it's the perfect spot. Birds chirping, water gurgling. So I'm settling down to eat, and I hear this sound. At first, I think it's probably a squirrel or something. They're pretty common around here. I had already seen a ton of them. But then the sound gets louder and heavier. Suddenly I'm on alert. I'm no stranger to wildlife, and I instantly knew that this was different. I can just feel it in my gut. So I decide to move towards it and check it out. I tread lightly, trying to figure out the source of the sound. And then I see it. This creature. Now it's not a bear not a mountain lion, not anything that you would expect to see in the mountains out here. It was something different. This creature stood on its hind legs like a human, but was much, much taller. The body was covered in these scales, like a lizard's, but these were larger, almost like armor plating. It was also a dark green color, almost black in some places, and its limbs were muscular but lean like a runner's, but way more powerful. And then the head was the most, let's say, striking part. It had these slanted, almond-shaped eyes that glowed this eerie yellow. It didn't have a snout or anything, more like a flat face. But there were these slits where a nose should be. And the mouth was filled with these sharp, jagged teeth. But they weren't like predator's teeth, more like Rows of serrated knives, if that makes sense. Now, I didn't see any wings or anything, but it had a long tail, almost as long as the body, and that used the tail for balance, I think, kind of how a kangaroo does. The hands, or claws, I guess, they were different, too. It had four fingers, but they were long and ended in these sharp, curved claws. But the thing I remember the most... The thing that really sticks with me is the way that the thing moved. It was so, so smooth, like water flowing over rocks, almost graceful. Now you're probably thinking I'm pulling your leg or messing with you, but I swear this is exactly what I saw. So I just spotted this reptilian creature, right? This is some next level, out of this world kind of thing I'm telling you but I had a good five minutes or so to just stare at the thing. So I'm there staring at this beast, and it's standing there at the edge of the clearing just observing me, like it's trying to figure me out. But here's the weird thing. The creature did not seem hostile. I mean, it was freaky as hell, sure, but it wasn't making any moves to attack or anything. So I take a step back real slow. I don't want to provoke it, But instead of coming at me, it just kind of, well, it mirrored me. As I moved, so did it, in the exact same way. It was like we were doing some weird kind of a dance. I know it sounds nuts, but it was as if the creature was just as curious about me as I was about it. We stood there for what felt like hours, but I'm sure it was just a few minutes. And at one point I could swear it made a sound like a low hum or something. I couldn't make much of it, but it didn't seem threatening. And then just as suddenly as it appeared, it turned and disappeared. 
just like that. I tell you, I was in shock. I mean, what was that? What did I just witness? So now at this point, there I was, alone in the clearing with my heart pounding like a drum. I'm just standing there thinking, did this really just happen? So after a few minutes of just standing there, trying to process everything, I decide to follow where the creature went. I couldn't just let it go, and I had to know more. Wouldn't you? So as I moved closer to where it disappeared, I noticed these huge tracks on the ground. Not anything I had ever seen in any guidebook. And in the air, it felt different too. Almost electric. It felt charged, and there was this energy around that I just can't explain. I pushed through the undergrowth following the tracks. It felt like I was in some kind of a dream or a movie. Like at any moment, I would just wake up back in my tent and it would all be over. But no, this was real, and it was actually happening. So as I walked further into the woods, I noticed that the tracks became harder to find. And then they started to disappear completely. It was like the creature had just vanished into thin air. I must have looked around for an hour or more, but there was no other sign of it. It was gone. But I swear to you that every time I closed my eyes that night, I could see it. Those eyes, the form, it was like it was burned into my memory. I still can't believe what I saw that day. I mean, who would, right? But that's the thing about nature. It never fails to surprise you. I'm going to share with you what happened to me in Savannah, Georgia in 2017. I was there because I'm an archaeologist. I love history, artifacts, all that kind of stuff. Now, Savannah is a funny place. It's old, it's beautiful, but it has a spooky side to it, especially if you know where to look. And I'm not talking about the city's famous haunted houses and cemeteries, but also the wild, untamed parts. Now, I've always had a knack for finding the strange and the unusual, even when I was a kid. It's part of why I got into archaeology. Anyway, one day we were working this dig and we came across this old, old foundation. Now, the team was all excited because it's not something we expected to find where we were. So we're clearing away the dirt and the rocks, and that's when I find this really odd carved shell. Its carvings were not readily understandable to me. It was old, and it had these strange markings on it, almost like hieroglyphics. And I'm not going to lie, it confused me a bit, but I was also very intrigued. So I decided to keep it, at least until I could figure out what it was. So fast forward to that night, I'm back at my place alone studying the shell and trying to make heads or tails of it. I was poring over old reference books and scanning the internet, doing whatever I could to uncover its secrets. As I'm sitting there, I start to notice something. It's gotten really quiet. I mean, quieter than it should have been. I glance over at the clock and it's just past midnight. And then I hear it, a low growl coming from outside the window. Now, there are plenty of animals out in Savannah, but this did not sound like something you would normally hear. It was deep, almost like a large dog, but there was something off about it. Now, I know what you're thinking. I've been spending too much time in the sun, but I swear to you, this happened. So there I was, right in the middle of the night, all alone with this weird growl echoing outside. And I have to tell you, my heart was racing. I mean, I'm not usually scared of wildlife, but something about that sound just was not right. I decided to peek outside to see what was making the noise. I opened the blinds slowly, not wanting to startle whatever was out there. And I'm telling you, what I saw, I will never forget. There, standing in the yard, was the biggest, most terrifying dog-like creature I had ever seen. This wasn't some stray dog or wolf. This thing was massive, like the size of a horse, and it had this thick, dark fur covering its body. Its eyes glowed eerie red in the darkness, and I could see its breath in the cool savanna night. I stood there looking, too scared to move, too scared to even think about what I was seeing. Was it a hallucination? Was I dreaming? 
At that point, I had no idea. All I knew was that I was staring at something that shouldn't exist. And then the creature did something unexpected. It tilted its head like it was curious. And then it leaned over, and I swear to you, it started scratching at the ground. And do you know what it revealed? Another shell. Same as the one I found at the dig site. And I don't know how, but I knew it wanted me to take it. I didn't want to go outside. Heck no. But something told me I had to. So as crazy as it sounds, I stepped out onto the porch. The creature didn't move, didn't growl. It just watched me. I moved slowly, my heart pounding in my chest. I went over and I reached down and picked up the shell. And as soon as my fingers closed around it, the creature let out this sort of a sigh, almost like it was relieved. And then it turned and went off into the night. And just like that, I was left standing there holding two strange shells, wondering if I had just lost my mind. I figured the best thing I could do was investigate them. Maybe they held some sort of a clue. So I spent the next few days researching. And what I found was shocking. It turns out it seems these shells were tied to the local Native Americans who first lived in the area. Apparently, they were tokens of peace, made to honor a pact between the people and the spirit of the land. This spirit, it was said, often took the form of a massive dog, a protector of the natural world. And then it all clicked. The dig site, the shells, the giant dog-like creature. Somehow. I had stumbled upon this centuries-old secret. Maybe, just maybe, that spirit was real, and it chose me to carry on the legacy. The more I thought about it, the more it seemed like a calling. I had always been interested in the past, unearthing things from long ago. Maybe this was my story to tell. I pondered my next steps and whether or not to tell the rest of the team what I found. But in the end, I left it alone and I kept it all to myself. That's basically where my story ends, for now at least. Maybe someday I'll have more to tell, but until then, I'm just continuing with my job, trying to understand more mysteries of the past. So that's my strange encounter in Savannah. Makes you think, doesn't it? Who knows what secrets the past holds? Denali National Park 2015. So, picture this. I'm up in Denali National Park in Alaska, the last frontier. Nature at its most raw and its most real. I'm there on this solo expedition, just me in the wild. But man, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So I'd set up my campsite near a stream, and after a long day of hiking, all I wanted was to soak in the peace maybe catch a glimpse of some wildlife. Little did I know, wildlife was going to catch a glimpse of me first. The sun was beginning to dip behind the mountains and the temperature was dropping fast. I mean, it was Alaska after all. I was tucking into my dinner when I heard it. A low growl, just on the edge of my hearing. Now I've been out in the wilderness a fair amount, so I know what bears sound like. But this... This was different, deeper, almost guttural, and it was getting closer. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing up like static electricity in the air. And then suddenly there was a crashing sound, like something big tearing through the underbrush. I could see it just on the edge of the light from my fire, barely more than a shadow. But, oh man, was it big. Like bigger than any grizzly I had ever seen. Its eyes, they were glowing in the firelight, not like a normal animal's eyes either. You know, reflecting light? No, these were bright, almost like they were producing their own light, and they were locked onto me. At this point, I was so scared I could barely move. I mean, what was I going to do? I was in the middle of nowhere, night was falling, and there was this this thing just beyond the light of my fire. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was like I was frozen in place. But then the thing moved and stepped into the light, and I could finally see it. Man, I wish I hadn't. 
It was like nothing I had ever seen before. Bigger than a bear, standing on its hind legs like a human. But the face, the face was all wrong. It was canine, like a wolf. But wrong. Twisted. So there I was, facing down this thing. I mean, it was like something out of a horror movie. And the eyes, the glowing eyes, they're burnt into my mind, even now. It was just staring at me, not making a sound, with its breath misting into the cold air. And I could see every ripple of muscle under its thick fur. And that's when it dawned on me. This thing wasn't just big. It was powerful. And then, as if it was reading my mind, it flexed its claws. And I'm talking claws like you would not believe. Like something out of a nightmare. I remember thinking, man, those could rip me apart without breaking a sweat. I was stuck there, right? On the one hand, my brain was screaming at me to run. But on the other, I knew that that would be a death sentence. You don't turn your back on a predator. Not unless you want to become dinner. And then the thing growled. Not like a dog growl. Not like a bear growl. This was something else entirely. It was deeper, more resonant. It filled the air and it made the hairs on my arms stand on end. Now I'm not a superstitious or religious guy, but in that moment I found myself praying. Praying to anything and everything that would listen. Because I knew, I just knew that I was in serious trouble. I don't know if it was my fear or the cold or what, but time seemed to slow down. I could see every breath I took, see the flicker of the firelight on the creature's fur. It was surreal like a dream, but way too real. Suddenly the creature tilted its head almost like it was curious, and then it sniffed at the air through its huge nostrils. I watched them flaring. I thought this was it. I was done for. I mean, how could I not be? right? But then just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned and disappeared into the night. I was left there shaking and alone, with only the dying embers of my fire for company. I didn't sleep a wink that night, or the next, or the one after that. Even now, back in civilization, I can't shake the memory of that creature. Its eyes glowing, its terrifying growl, and the sheer size and power of it. I've told my story to a few people, but most don't believe me. They say it was probably just a bear or a trick of the light, but I know what I saw. I know what's out there, in the wilds of Denali National Park. Sedona, Arizona, 2019. Let me tell you about something crazy that happened to me. I was visiting Sedona in beautiful Arizona, famous for its red rock formations. And I'm a bit of a night owl. I love stargazing and all that. So there I am in the middle of nowhere, just outside of Sedona, and it's pitch black, perfect for star watching. So I'm sitting there in my truck. I have a flask of coffee. I'm staring up at the sky and the stars are popping, you know, like tiny fairy lights all across the black sky. And then out of nowhere, things got weird. There's this streak of light that shoots across the sky. And I'm thinking, wow, a shooting star. You know, normal stargazing stuff. But this one, it didn't behave like any shooting star I've ever seen. It slowed down. That's right. It slowed down in the middle of the sky. And then it just hung there, like it was suspended or something. You would think at this point that I would be freaked out, but oddly, I wasn't. I was, I don't know, intrigued. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was hanging there, sort of pulsating. It's hard to describe. But then as I'm watching, it starts to change shape. I know, it sounds crazy, right? But I'm telling you that this light in the sky started shifting, morphing into a more structured shape. It looked like a craft of some kind, not like any plane or helicopter, and it was totally silent. There was this eerie calm around. You could hear a pin drop. So this light, this craft, it's just sitting there in the sky, and you have to understand that this wasn't some far-off thing. It was close. 
close enough to make me wonder if I should turn my truck around and get out of there. But I didn't. I was just too drawn in. It was like the thing in the sky was calling me. I know it sounds bonkers, right? But there I am, in the middle of nowhere, staring at this thing like a moth to a flame. And then as if things weren't weird enough, the craft starts to descend. Slowly. Eerily silently. I could see it more clearly now, and it was metallic, reflecting the moonlight. Smooth and oval-shaped, like nothing terrestrial. Suddenly this beam of light comes from the craft, illuminating the ground right in front of me. I'm telling you, this was not your typical spotlight. It was more like a column of pure energy, and it was coming straight towards me. At this point, I should have been scared, right? Any sane person would have been. But no, not me. I felt calm, peaceful almost. It's hard to explain. It was like I knew, somehow, that this thing, whatever it was, meant no harm. So now this beam of light is getting closer, and then it just stops, about a few feet from me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, who would? I was half expecting to be lifted up into the sky like one of those sci-fi movies. But no, that didn't happen. Instead, something else did. Something that was, if possible, even stranger. The light beam started to shimmer like heat waves off of a hot road. And then it started to take form, a form that looked human-like. I know that sounds insane, but that's what happened. The beam of light turned into a humanoid form. There it was, right in front of me, a being made of light. It was so bright I had to squint, but the most amazing thing was that it didn't hurt my eyes. It was a soft, soothing light. There was something peaceful and serene about it. Now at this point, you'd think I'd be freaking out, but no, not even close. I was fascinated. It was like I was witnessing something incredible, beyond my understanding. And so now there's this light being standing in front of me, and I'm just staring with my mouth probably hanging open. But the being, it doesn't do anything aggressive. It just stands there, like it's observing me, just as much as I am it. And then it does something. Something that to this day I can't quite wrap my head around. It lifts a hand, or what seems to be a hand, and points at me. Not in a threatening way, mind you, more like acknowledgement. And the next thing that happened, well, this is the part where people usually think I've gone off the deep end. But I swear to you, it's the truth. The being, it started to communicate with me. Now, before you jump to conclusions, let me clarify, there were no words, no sound, but it was as if its thoughts, images, emotions were being directly transmitted into my mind. I know that sounds crazy too, but that's the only way I can describe it. There was this overwhelming sense of peace, understanding, and connection. I can't quite describe it. It felt like I was part of something bigger. Something grand and beautiful. All right, so this communication or whatever it was lasted for only a few minutes, but it felt like hours, and it was like I was lost in a world of thoughts and feelings. It was incredibly intense, but not in a bad way. And then just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. The being withdrew its hand, and the connection was severed. I was left standing there, feeling like I had just woken from a dream. The next thing I knew, the being was starting to dissolve. It was like it was becoming one with the beam of light again. Within a few seconds, the being was gone, and all that remained was the beam of light pointing towards the sky. And then the light retracted back into the craft. It was like watching a movie in reverse. The craft, now devoid of the beam of light, hung there in the sky for a few more moments, and then just shot off disappeared into the night sky without a sound. And just like that, it was over. I was left standing there in the middle of nowhere with nothing but the stars. I got back into my truck, heart still pounding, mind racing with a million questions. I've never told many people this story, you know, because it sounds so unbelievable. 
but every time I look up at the stars, I can't help but remember that night, that encounter. I don't know what it was, why it happened, or if it will ever happen again, but I do know this. It changed me. It changed the way I see the world, the universe, and most of all, it changed the way I see myself.